Now I will show you one of the methods for iron production proposed by the legendary high-speed gasifiers developer Chukhanov. By using it, commercial iron can be smelted from waste products, such as dross or dust-like ore. In general, this is a quite closed topic. Those who make money in it keep quiet and hide their secrets because money loves silence. Marketable metal is very expensive today, and it is made only at large metallurgical plants which belong to very rich and influential people. But you can make your own mini metallurgical plant quite inexpensively in comparison with the profit that it can bring. I once made calculations for a plant that would work with my successful 4 megawatt industrial gasifier. Estimations showed tens of thousands of dollars earning a day. This idea is still in my head. Now I will tell you about a method that everyone can implement. Maybe there is someone among you who wants to finance it. For several years, my acquaintances and I were considering a possibility of melting scrap metal or oil dross with generator gas. Metallurgical plants don't take these wastes for remelting. There, dross oil, passing through a high temperature, enters into the electrostatic precipitator with air and explodes. But dross is practically a commercial metal if it is reduced to commercial grade iron. With titanic efforts, I managed to find a person who knows how to lay gas cupolas in Kiev. In search of a way to melt iron with generator gas, I had to photograph and read about 60 books and a stock of patents on this topic. And that's what I saw. At one time, many attempts, and failures, were made. But inventors did manage to melt steel using generator gas in a conventional gas cupola, and that was in 1945. The scheme of this generator gas cupola is on my desktop. Just when it was the end of the war, and there was nothing, and steel or cast iron was very much needed, the engineers managed to do this. But they worked on the edge because generator gas from ordinary dry wood obtained from a downdraft gasifier gives a flame temperature close to 1100 degrees. An updraft wood gasifier gives a flame temperature close to 1300 degrees because its gas contains 30 to 50 times more tar. Tar is a liquid hydrocarbon, as good as oil with 7,600 kilocalories calorie content. It makes the temperature of the torch a couple of hundred degrees higher and allows gas calorie content to reach 1,500 kilocalories. Today, we can make the temperature of this torch even higher thanks to almost inexterminable plastic garbage. I have several videos about Soviet experiments with injecting fuel oil or similar liquid hydrocarbons, now they can be waste oil, into a downdraft wood gasifier. The maximum mass ratio of hydrocarbons to wood was 7 to 3. This ratio allowed the gasifier to operate normally without the combustion zone being cooled and pipelines being jammed with soot. I.e. 10 kg of fuel consisted of 7 kg of hydrocarbons and 3 kg of wood. The maximum gas caloric value that could be obtained reached 3,300 kilocalories, which is three times more than the caloric value of ordinary generator gas. This is much more than 1,500 kilocalories gas from an updraft wood gasifier. The inventors injected liquid fuel oil, but you can do it differently, just mixing wood with plastic waste. The effect will be the same. I showed a video on my channel about how I designed a low-tar gasifier for one guy's minivan. When the owner mixed plastic waste with the wood, the minivan actually drove better due to the higher gas caloric value. Unfortunately, Soviet engineers focused on wood-fired trucks. Fuel consumption, range, and flame temperature were not measured. But even so, it is clear that the temperature of the gas obtained from the wood and plastic mixture will be above 1,300 degrees provided by 1,500 kilocalories gas obtained from a downdraft wood gasifier. A few words about the theory of melting steel with generator gas. In order to increase the flame temperature and melt metal in a cupola, the generator gas must be mixed with air in a premix burner. The only way to increase the flame temperature is to heat the air, or gas, entering the burner. To do this, the first Soviet inventors used an ordinary tubular heat exchanger made of 100 mm pipes. They even made relevant accurate calculations. I have read all their papers where they were looking for a way to increase the combustion temperature of the generator gas flame. The pipes were mounted in the upper part of the cupola in a circle and heated the air by the exhaust flue gases. When the Pennyworth pipes burned out, they were simply changed. It didn't cost much. Today, use thick-walled 100 mm pipes will not cost too much either. Without air heating, wood generator gas with a caloric value of 1,100 kilocalories gave 1,100 degrees. 
With air heating, it became possible to reach 1550 degrees. And the inventors managed to melt metal at this temperature, albeit with problems. Sometimes part of the gas was burned in a ceramic heat exchanger to increase the temperature of the air entering the burner. Today, due to plastic waste, we can triple the gas caloric value, up to 3,300 kilocalories. The gas combustion temperature also increases. We're getting to the point where we can melt steel in a conventional gas cupola, basically, a brick column, using an ordinary tubular heat exchanger mounted on its top. It is certainly possible to build a gas heating chamber to heat gas by burning any other fuel. In addition to this method, in the USSR, the flame temperature was raised to the steel melting point by inputting up to 6% oxygen into the gasifier. Thus, nitrogen was partially displaced, and the flame reached the required 1,600 degrees. In another case, 15% propane was added to the generator gas which also made it possible to reach a combustion temperature of 1,600 degrees. Ordinary natural gas burns at 1,600 degrees. It can easily melt steel in gas cupolas. That's what USSR did. But now natural gas is not available or it is too expensive. I spoke about the method I had developed for melting steel in gas cupolas. This is a very simple and cheap method. It is easy to buy a used fireclay brick and build a column out of it. I can make it right now. But there is another or processing method proposed by Chukhanov. Let's take a look at it, too. For example, in Ukraine, in the Krivy RIH basin, one of the best ores contains about 60% of metal. The reserves are colossal. Ukraine has 20% of the world's iron ore deposits. Ukraine ranks first in the world in terms of iron ore deposits, and seventh in terms of iron production. At least, it was the seventh until the recent events. There's a book in front of my eyes telling how Soviet scientists were going to smelt ore with generator gas using small ore deposits around Kiev. The ore contains up to 80% of iron, these reserves were considered small due to the gigantic scales of everything developed in the USSR. Giant metallurgical plants were built for giant deposits, but low deposits around Kiev are enough for a small factory running on generator gas. I once did a cursory estimation of profitability. You can double check it. For example, smelting 1 kilogram of ore requires 1 kilowatt of thermal energy. By the way, firing bricks requires the same amount of energy. Interesting dependency. I get 3.7 kilowatts of thermal energy from 1 kilogram of drywood waste. 1 kilogram of plastic bags produce about 10 kilowatts of thermal energy. Car tires, about 8 kilowatts. Thus, the column I designed and proved for 4 megawatts of heat per hour produces about 4 tons of finished iron per hour. Minus the time to warm up the cupola and heat the ore. Please write in the comments how much 1 kilogram of iron costs today, even if sold to a scrap metal station. It is already becoming clear that tens of thousands of dollars are earned in just one day. In just one day. Of course, there is some spending for ore, or scrap metal, delivery, preparation, and shipment. The tire cord can also be remelted. Normally, it's not recyclable because it burns in furnaces. But there is no oxygen in a cupola heated by generator gas, so the thin cord does not burn. By the way, the method allows getting 80 grade steel. The cord, rusting idle because cannot be sold anywhere, can be 30 fold profitable. The smelting furnace must be located either at the mine or close to existing steel plants in order to take the dross on the spot and not carry it back and forth. It is also desirable to locate it closer to the railway in order to load the iron not onto trucks, but directly into wagons. That is, there are nuances. Now let me show you Chukhanov's 1946 patent. It was obtained just after World War II and offers a different way to recover iron ore with generator gas. Figure 1 shows the entire melting line scheme, and Figure 2 shows the reactor scheme. Look at Figure 1. The gas heater is marked by number 1. It heats the gas to a temperature from 1100 to 1400 degrees Celsius. There is feeder 4 and hopper 3 after heater 1. Or mixed with lime and other solid additives goes from the hopper into the feeder. The ore recovers in reactor 2. As I understand it, the reactor is a line cyclone. The already reduced iron ore, dust, and slag accumulate at the bottom of the cyclone. The figure shows the reacted gas from reactor 2. Its temperature of 1,400 degrees Celsius is indicated. The gas goes to the gasifier marked by the number 5. 
The gasifier shown in the patent runs on semi-coke or anthracite. But we can also use an ordinary downdraft gasifier with wood and plastic waste. The only thing is that in this case, it will be impossible to restore the already reacted gas, as Chukhanov suggested. We see a cyclone marked by the number 6 and the heat exchanger marked by 7. An additional gas purifier is marked by the number 8. After filter 8, the gas enters fan 9. Then the gas passes into gas tank 10 and heat exchanger 7. Excessive gas can be taken for other needs from the gas tank. In heat exchanger 7, the gas is heated by the heat of the gas leading the gasifier. Then it passes through the pipe into heater 1 and heats up even more. As far as I understand, heater 1 is where the generator gas is burned to heat the same generator gas to the correct temperature. Then the iron reduction reaction begins. Anything could be burned in heater 1 to heat gas. Now let's look at figure 2. The gas comes to the cyclone-shaped reactor of direct iron reduction through pipe 1. Any type of pipe can be used. In those days, pipes were laid out of brick. The temperature in the reactor itself is maintained from 1200 to 1500 degrees. If you like what I said and you want to work in this direction, my WhatsApp, as always, is under the video. See you later.